Okay, everyone. Last session of the day. Ha 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 ha. Always, uh, always a challenge to, to stay focused, but uh, I promise to be interesting. Um, how many of you were at my talk yesterday? Okay, good. Um, the talk yesterday was about indexing. Uh, this one is much broader. Uh, it's about the non-relational features of Postgres. Um, I'll start talking about some of the generalities of uh, relational systems, some of the history. And then launch into a 10-point um, list of non-relational features of Postgres and sort of explain why that's uh, a really exciting thing for, for the project. Uh, my name is Bruce Momgen. I've been working for Postgres for 20 years. Well, I work for Enterprise DB, who of course uh, supplies uh, support and training and tooling and custom version of Postgres. Uh, I'm enjoying my 10th year there. And I'm also one of the Postgres core team members, so uh, I've been doing a lot of work with Postgres. Uh, that URL right there at the bottom uh, is actually where all the slides are located. So if you want to look at the slides now um, or some other time, it's not very bright. I don't know why. Oh, I think it's the screen. It's the way the screen is. Anyway, that's the URL, and you can see that. This presentation, as long as a large number of other ones uh, on that website. Uh, I will be taking questions as I go, so obviously I'll take breaks and um, answer any questions you have about, about Postgres. We do have a, a large number of slides here, uh, 71 slides for 50 minutes, so that's always somewhat of a challenge, uh, but uh, I guarantee we'll finish on time. So um, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about Postgres and relational storage. Um, honestly, you know, I've been, I've been with Postgres for 20 years, and obviously when you think of the features of Postgres, you think of, oh, we added that seven years ago, we added that five years ago, we added that three years ago. You think of it chronologically. Um, and one of the interesting things about why I created this talk is I started to think back of some of the stuff we had done in the past 20 years, and I realized it was quite a body of knowledge, uh, and quite a body of features um, that, that had been developed over that time that makes Postgres unique in the database space. And I think that's what I'm gonna try and highlight here, and I'll explain why I think that's, that's a pretty revolutionary thing, and we'll, is something that will continue to define Postgres even more in the years to come. Um, historically, Postgres, has been sort of playing catch up to a lot of the uh, more traditional enterprise databases. Uh, but in the past couple of years, we pretty much reached parity at that, at that level. And what this presentation is gonna highlight is Postgres kind of going beyond what these other relational systems can do and starting to talk about some non-traditional workloads that actually work very well uh, in, as part of or combined with a relational database. And I think um, there's going to be increased adoption of Postgres because of these features, because of um, the fact that Postgres does things that no one else does, uh, rather than Postgres doing just the same as everyone else does. So anyway, um, I'm going to get into that in a couple minutes. Um, any questions before we start? Cool. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about history. Relational storage. Relational storage. Uh, originally proposed by E.F. Codd in 1970. What is that? 30, 46 years ago. Uh, that's a long time. Uh, I wasn't even involved in databases. I was nine years old. So um, It has really stood the test of time. Um, it's very flexible. Uh, but, you know, it's not always perfect. Um, we kind of get into these paradigms where we think, oh, everything has to be object-oriented. Oh, everything's got to be relational. Oh, everything's got to be, um, you know, this or that. Well, yeah, it's not really true. There's always exceptions. And um, with the sort of explosion of web apps and GIS and, and uh, Internet of Things and, and bringing even more data into databases than you traditionally have in the past, things like purchase data and data analytics and stuff, you start to see a lot of cases where relational storage doesn't always work great. Um, so what is relational storage? Relational storage by EF Cod is basically the idea that everything is a row and a column. They're combined into tables. Uh, you have constraints. And then you normalize everything. Now, you normalize in the you know, first normal form, second normal form, 
third normal form, second normal modified form, whatever. Um, there's a URL there that explains it. Um, but you know, the first normal form, this is like the base form, uh, effectively defines where the, what relational storage re it represents. The idea that each column or attribute contains an atomic indivisible value. Now, what atomic indivisible is, um, is up to debate. I'll talk about that later. Um, but that's the concept. Um, you don't have repeating groups in a relational storage. You create a separate table for each related set of data, and you identify each set of data with a primary key. Okay, and again, I have some URLs there if you're interested. But you know, first normal form is not always ideal. Yes, it's very flexible. Yes, it's probably the way you should start most of your data modeling, but you need to identify when that data modeling really doesn't fit any of the normal forms, and I'm gonna explain why. Uh, first, query performance. Uh, first normal form, again, very flexible, very easy to represent things, very easy to understand from, an, from a, a, a DBA or a developer perspective, but it can suffer from query performance issues. Queries can become very complex as you atomize the data, as you normalize it. Uh, storage can be inflexible, so a lot of times storing things atomized is very inefficient. You have a lot of overhead. And there are also indexing limitations, which you might not identify right away, but as I get to farther in the presentation, I think those indexing limitations will become clearer. Okay, so that's just kind of a teaser of sort of how I'm looking at it, why I think um, you know, this is a really interesting aspect of Postgres in an area that's gonna be uh, more and more interesting. So this is what we're gonna focus on. Again, six minutes into the talk. Uh, we're gonna focus on the idea of eight major non-relational storage types. And what I'm gonna be highlighting for these eight is the idea that because these are non-relational storage, they actually give us advantages over a normalized data environment. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of hammer that home for each data type. I'll show you the data type, I'll show you how it's used, I'll try and explain why traditional normalization doesn't work for this data type, and I'll also highlight indexing which actually works really well in Postgres for these non-relational data types, doesn't work so well in a lot of the other relational systems out there. And this is, again, an area where Postgres continues to shine. Again, if you were in the talk yesterday and I talked about GIN indexes and GIST indexes and SPGIST and, and so forth, you have an inkling of kind of what I'm getting at, that the, uh, the Russian uh, developers particularly have been very adept at creating some of these very unusual methods for indexing the non-relational storage, um, and I'm gonna highlight that. So let me take questions. Okay, great, okay. So let's start with the first one. This is a very brain dead, kind of very simple one, an array, okay? Postgres has a built-in array type. Is this relational? No, okay? Did it come from Berkeley? Yes. So, hey, it came, it's not relational, but it came from a, a, a university known to be uh, you know, very uh, foundational in database and operating system design. Um, one of the reasons arrays are not relational is effectively the idea that every column is supposed to contain one piece of data, and by definition, arrays contain multiple, okay? Um, why were they added? Well, frankly, uh, they were added not only because they thought users would use them, but Postgres internally actually uses arrays. A lot of this, couple of the system tables, PG class, PG proc, actually have arrays in them to represent things like function arguments, variable number, uh, things like permissions, variable number, okay? Could we have taken those, inf that piece, those, in those pieces of information and placed them in another table? Yes. Would it have been cumbersome and slow to access that other table while you're running a query to look up the function arguments and look up the, um, you know, the permissions on an object? Yes, so there were practical performance reasons, practical simplicity reasons, where bunching a bunch of data inside of one column when, when practical and when uh, it makes sense is actually a good thing, okay? So here's an example, I have an employee table um, I basically create the deploy table and I also create a certification column or attribute 
where it's called text, but it's got little brackets after it. Now, I could have put a number in there. That number would represent the length of the array, but it's only for documentation. It isn't, it isn't uh, enforced at all, so I just left it blank. Um, but effectively, this certification field is now an array of strings. Okay, Not one string, but an array of strings. Could I have put the certification in another table? Yes. So every time I went to the employee, I joined it to the certification table, and I put its primary key on it, and do all sorts of validation against it. And I was like, you know, we just want to throw certifications. We don't want to validate against it. We don't want to do reports against it. We kind of just want a little column where I can throw some certifications in there. And I think that, that makes sense. Again, you have to know what your needs are, uh, but there's some practical reasons where just having an array makes sense. Um, so if I want to insert into that array, it's actually very easy. Um, I basically use single quotes around uh, a string, and then in braces, curly brackets, I'm sorry, not braces, curly brackets, I actually have uh, these qu double quoted strings, CCA, ACSP, and CESSP, I believe it was, yes, CISSP. Um, and those are, my, those are my three certifications for that particular employee. I can do a select star, and it displays them kind of in one big bunch here. Um, I can also do this, which is kind of cool. This is the containment operator. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a case where I actually want to take a field, certifications, and I want to say, does this field contain this particular value. You're going to see this containment operator over and over again. Um, it's used for a whole bunch of different data types, but it basically means, am I inside of this other thing, is effectively what it is. And you can see it's very clear in terms of how to write the query. Give me all the employees who have that certification, and it comes out just fine. Okay. Um, I can do other things. I can look at the first element of the array. Uh, arrays are one based for because that's the way the SQL standard defines it. So here I'm saying give me the first certification. I can unnest the, the array so I can take the array and like make it go instead of across, like make it separate rows for each, array, for each uh, uh, value in the array. Um, I can go and I can use unnest with another thing and now I've kind of created what looks like a join but it isn't. But I basically said take the name and repeat it for every unnest of the thing. And it looks like a join. I can join this to another table. OK? Um, I can even do this. Here I'm taking um, a particular set of four rows, in this case from PG class, and I can go the opposite direction. So unnest takes me from an array to a set of rows. Uh, array ag takes me from a number of rows into an array. It's going, going the opposite direction. Okay, so you can kind of see not only can you store stuff in array, but you can kind of move them in and out of row-based analysis uh, very easily. Any questions? Okay, number two, range types. I talked about this briefly yesterday. Um, it's kind of a cryptic data type that a lot of people don't really see the value for. Um, I do have some stuff on my blog about why this is really useful, but let me just walk you through uh, why I think it's useful. Um, right up here at the top, we create a car rental table, and uh, we create a, a column for the, the car, I assume, um, and then we create a time span, which in this case is uh, very cryptically called TSTZ range, which represents time stamp with time zone range, okay? And the second line in red is what it looks like. It's effectively a start and stop time uh, in one field. Okay, remember I told you normally you would atomize this, you'd have a column that start and you have a separate column that stop. The problem with having a separate column with start and a separate column with stop is A, your queries are very complicated. B, the optimizer can't make a whole lot of use of it because if you say start greater than this and stop greater than that, it's kind of hard for the optimizer to optimize that. And third, it's very hard to index it because effectively you have one index on start over here and you have one index on stop over here and they really can't work together. So one of the exciting things I'm going to show you a little later is you can actually use indexing on this, which is really cool. So again, a whole people aren't going to use this from day one, but it does, it does have a lot of uses. So here's an example of very clean syntax. We don't have to play with separate fields. It kind of documents itself. I'm basically saying um, go and take 
um, my car rental table and give me the time span that contains this particular time point. So I've got a point in time, and I'm saying give me the span that spans this. There may be more than one. In this case, there's just one. I only put one row in there. If I ask for a time span that doesn't match, I get nothing, which you, you kind of get, right? That makes sense. Here's a more complicated example. I'm actually creating um, another, I'm adding to this table some more, and I'm creating over, I believe, a thousand uh, different car rental events that are going in from 2001 to 2010. Okay, so actually, I guess it would be 3,000, uh, 3,500 events because it's one day a year and it's 10 years, um, roughly. Uh, so what I've done is I put a row in for every day from 2001 to, 20, to 2010. And if I run this query, I say, give me the car rental that spans this time. I get one row. And if you notice, it's actually doing a sequential scan. That's kind of yucky because it's reading the whole table to find out where a particular car was at a particular time. Uh, frankly, if, if your data type doesn't index well, it's a toy data type in a lot of ways. If you, you, know, you can put a couple hundred rows in, but when you start putting millions of rows, if you don't have an index that really understands this data type, you're not really going to write any kind of really high performing application with it. Fortunately, all the data types I'm going to list here have indexing support. So what I actually can do is I can create a gist index. Those of you who remember from yesterday, I mentioned gist. I basically say create an index on the time span field. Notice I'm not specifying start or stop. I'm just giving it that TS, TZ range column. And I'm saying create a gist index on that. And then boom, all of a sudden, when I ask to create a uh, find me the row that contains this particular point in time, now I'm using an index scan. Okay, using special sort of gist logic, very similar to the way we do geographic points uh, using R tree. We have special code to do uh, range type indexing, and it's able to pull up that row really, really fast. And all you can imagine, if you had billions of rows, sequential scan of billions of rows, bad, 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 indexing support, good, 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 right? And again, a lot more powerful than having a start column and a stop column and trying to index both of them and trying to get the index to kind of use both of them at the same time just doesn't really work very well, right? Whereas this system understands the uh, particular value, the way there's two things in that field and can take very good use of that, okay? Another cool thing you can do with it, and this is kind of really crazy, is you can actually add something called an exclusion constraint, which I'm not really going to go into in any detail. Um, but why can't I? I'm having trouble getting. Oh, there. There's an exclusion constraint like that. And effectively, I'm using a special overlaps operator there at the end with two ampersands. And what that does is it says, do not allow any overlapping intervals inside this column. Very hard to do in an application. Very hard to do with some kind of trigger because you have concurrent people inserting into the table at the same time. So doing this individually is kind of hard, but hey, creating what appears to be an exclusion constraint, pff, real easy. Uses the index, handles it for you. You don't have to create any triggers. You don't have to deal with concurrent access problems. It basically says don't allow any conflicting uh, overlaps in there. And we could have used a different type of operator. Overlaps is just probably the most natural one to use in this particular case. Questions? Yes, sir. Would that specific type of data type where you're using time like that, if your application spans multiple time zones, can you specify time zone in the insert data? So the question is, if you have uh, an insert into this particular field and you're inserting for multiple time zones, can you specify that? Uh, the answer is yes. When you do the insert, in this case, notice I'm using this kind of string, you know, it's an ISO format string. I can actually put the time zone specification here at the end. Um, I can also set the time zone for the session. And therefore, all of the time going in would be assumed to be within that time zone that your session is has. There's an environment variable called time zone, I think. And uh, you basically set it to EST or GMT or, or Asia slash Tokyo. Uh, and then all of your data that you, every insert that doesn't specify a time zone is assumed to use, um, is used to use the session time zone. Now, you might, and you might wonder, 
well, how do they play together in the same table? And the answer is they play together very cleanly. What effectively happens is the data is always stored in GMT. Okay, so even though you might mix a whole bunch of stuff in different time zones, when you query it, it's going to come out in your local time zone. There's not going to be any uh, like entries that are going to be mixed. They're all going to come out in the exact same time zone. In fact, when you insert the data, once that data is inserted, the, the storage does not know the original time zone you used. There's no record. If you needed to record the actual time zone you used, you'd have to have a separate field and actually insert probably the current time zone setting for that session into that field. And then you'd have your timestamp or timestamp range column. And then you'd have a separate column that just had the original time zone for that particular entry. Because obviously, if you stored different time zones in, in original format in the table, then effectively you'd have to be converting them as you went from row to row. And like, forget that, right? Imagine what a con exclusion constraint would look like, you know. So um, the data basically, as it goes in, it effectively is stored at the current time zone database specification offset and convert to GMT at insert time. Other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. So the question is, um, because it's a range, how would you specify things like, I don't know the end time? Um, or, for example, um, you didn't ask this question, but I will put it in your mouth. Um, the question is, how do I specify whether the begin time or end time is exclusive or inclusive? Okay. So if you take a look at the example I have right here, you will notice that there is a bracket right here. Okay. And there is a parenthesis out here at the end. And what that's telling me is that the insert time, the begin time is inclusive because it's a bracket and the end time is exclusive. That's why it's a parenthesis. Okay. In addition, either the start or end time could be specified as infinity or negative infinity, um, at which point uh, that means that there is no specification for the start and the stop and therefore it would span either from the beginning to infinity or from infinity to the stop time, uh, which would be the natural case. You can also put a null in there. Um, and they behave slightly differently, and I, I really don't want to get into that, but um, there's certainly specification, and we spent a lot of time designing how to handle unknown pieces of this data in a lot of discussion. Uh, and we, we did this probably five years ago, and we're very happy with the, with the outcome. So, uh, please read up on the docs to read how to, to the details of how null is different from infinity um, and, and how <laughs> there's some philosophical things of how do you, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get into it, but there's some philo interesting philosophical questions of how you handle various uh, conflicts in that area. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So if I had more than two entries in a time format? Yes. 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 So would it have to match the exact time stamp or would it be like between the range? Right. So so the question is if, if if we had more than one row and we ran the query, like would the time have to match exactly? What, the, the highlight here is I'm using that containment operator. The same containment operator I used in the previous array example. And what this is telling me is that and I want to see a row where any range spans across that moment in time right there. OK? So it's similar to the array. It's not exactly the same because the array, you're right, the array was saying, give me any element that, um, the array is saying, give me any element that is in the array. And it's treating them all kind of the same. The, the ampersand greater than pays a little differently here where it's saying, give me any span where this point is part of the span. OK, so the traditional case in this example is, tell me the record that was active at midnight on that date is, is, effectively, um, is effectively what we're doing, because we kind of just want to know where it was. So it turned out, in this case, that it matched a start time. But it didn't have to. It could have been any time in that range. And thank you all. Might, maybe I'll change the example to show, to show that. Other questions? 
Okay, so let's try another one. Uh, now we're at geometry, again, a completely different case, although it has a lot of similarities to the range type. <clears throat> because range type had two values, right? Start and stop, right? This one has two values, except they're x and y. But you know, the indexing is kind of the same in, in a way. The, the way it just does indexing of points and the way it does indexing of, of ranges is actually similar. So here I actually create, um, and, and not, I'm showing you geometry here, but PostGIS uses this exact same system, the exact same kind of layout. So here I do create table. Uh, it's a dart table. I have a dart number, and then I have a point which is made up of x and y on this thing. And then I actually create, I insert into the table a case where I'm going to place 1,000 random darts on the dart board. Um, again, I'm not trying to get it in the center. They're just randomly put on the dart board. Um, I know it's kind of hokey, but this is what it looks like. Here's a list of five of the darts, and you can see the x and y points uh, for the various darts. Um, I can use uh, the containment operator, although I'll notice that it kind of goes the opposite direction. It's less than at sign instead of at sign greater than sign, but it's just going the opposite way. I can say, give me all the darts which are within four unit distance of the center, which happens to be 50-50. And the way I do that is I actually take a circle, which is another geometric type that we support. That's the syntax for a circle, center 50-50 radius 4. I'm casting that to a circle, and I'm saying, give me the locations which are contained within that circle. Similar exactly to where I said, give me the ranges which are contained, which contain this particular point. Okay, so now I've got a circle. I'm saying, give me the ones that are within that circle. It turns out there are five rows, uh, five darts within that four unit circle of the center. But, you know, I want this to be a production dartboard. I'm imagining billions of darts being thrown. And boo, 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 it's doing a sequential scan. That's not going to help me. I'm going to be very slow. I'm going to have to search through the, every dart to find ones within a certain distance. So, yay, he comes to the, just comes to the rescue. Um, we basically can create an index and just give it the point location. Uh, which it knows is a point, it knows how to index it, and now all of a sudden if I say give me all the darts within four units of the center, I get an index scan, which is really, really, really cool. Um, if that's not cool enough, you can do some even more cool stuff. I did allude to this yesterday. So here I'm actually saying give me the two closest darts to the center. And that's usually very hard to do in a relational database. Normally you have to create like a circle, give me everything within 10, and then if I have more than two, then I have to look at those, everything within 10 units, and then like sort by distance. That's usually the way you have to do it. In a relational, you have to do two steps, because if you do a, a square of 10 or a circle of 10, and then you don't have two darts, then you gotta do a circle of 100. And if you don't have two darts in there, you gotta do a circle of 1,000, you have to keep, making your circle bigger until you get enough darts that you can then compute the distances and sort them. That's usually the way you have to do it. Fortunately, Postgres has something called nearest neighbor search, which allows you to do it in one query. We basically kind of walk around the index until we get two. I know it's kind of crazy. You can talk to Oleg Bartunov, who's here, uh, the big Russian guy, um, uh, Kalmyk uh, Russian guy who, uh, who was working on this. And they basically walk around the index until they get two points. They compute the distances they go, and then they return the heap rows that match. It's just amazing stuff. This is, this is a game changer if you're doing a lot of GIS stuff. Um, this is really cool. Now, of course, the dartboard example is completely ridiculous, but you know, give me all the houses within 10, give me all the bars within 10, these kind of things. Uh, the, the closest bar seems to be a big query in every demo I've heard of. But anyway, I like the darts better. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. So the point is that um, this is assuming a flat projection because it's just geometric type. It assumes the units are the same width and so forth. If we were using PostGIS, yes, indeed, it would know the distance based on the coordinate system that you used when you stored the data. And it would convert various coordinate systems to a uniform coordinate system um, to do the. 
Correct. The operator is exactly the same. Yeah. In fact, you'll notice the operator we're using here is the spaceship operator or the distance operator, not the gr at greater. Maybe that one's containment, contains in a circle. Here we're saying, give me, we're, it, it's kind of an awkward syntax, but it works really great. Again, an example of Postgres kind of going that extra mile uh, where we've actually got a case where um, we're t we're, we're, our actual query our actual restriction is in the order by clause, right? Like, how often do you see that? You know, it's usually where something. This is order by something, and that's how you that's how you um, you uh, instantiate or call the nearest neighbor operator. If I didn't use the limit clause here, I would get all of the points in order of distance from the center, right? I mean, this is cool. But what's also cool is when you use the limit, it doesn't compute all the points and then give you the top two. It knows to do two and stop. This is pretty, pretty crazy stuff. And I believe Postgres may be the only one that does this uh, kind of feature. Other questions? Although I expect other databases to copy them, as they have copied other things we've done. OK. Um, hmm. Interesting. Okay, um, that is very odd. Um, so we're gonna let's talk a little about XML. Postgres does allow um, XML storage. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail on it because XML, frankly, is just not super popular. I'm not like dissing XML, but we've had it for a bunch of years and it just doesn't seem to do a whole, we don't get a lot of questions about it. So I'm gonna kind of just buzz through. I have a lot of slides and again, you can look at them in detail. So what I did is I basically looked at the Fumatic printer driver on my Debian server. I pulled a bunch of XML files and I loaded them into an XML uh, flat file and I basically created a table with an XML column. I just loaded in the XML. Uh, but you can do cool stuff with XML. You can do XPath queries. Here's an XPath query looking for the short name of particular printers. Um, I can actually get rid of the array reference by looking at the first element. Um, I can convert them to text. So now they're text strings. I can, um, I can actually look at the first um, element and then I can order by them. So now I'm taking the text, I'm converting to text, now I'm ordering by and giving me the first five. Um, I can pull in like five random. I can do X path where the actual attribute is not at the root, so it's looking within the path and finding anything in there. Um, so there's an example of, of the uh, printer's names. Um, I can unnest that. We saw that with arrays. I mean, these, is, these are arrays here, right? Because they got the braces. So I can unnest it and I can do that. Um, I can even do this crazy thing. I'm using common table expressions. I'm making all the arrays. Um, I'm nesting them. I'm filling them into another query, and I'm saying, give me all the HP uh, particular drivers that, which are in this XML document. Okay. Um, again, if, if if your eyes just glazed over, that's okay. Um, it's just showing that, that this is another type of non-relational uh, data that we can store. Questions? Okay. So let's take a look at JSON. Um, this type of type was developed about five years ago. Uh, this is not JSON B. And I'm going to talk about JSON B in a minute. This is not the JSON B. Now it's a little confusing because we have a JSON type which stores JSON, and then we have a JSON B type which stores JSON. Kind of confusing. I'm sorry about that. There are some good reasons for it, and I'll explain why. The JSON data type is, a, is basically similar to the XML data type in that you just store the JSON unadulterated, okay? Take the JSON document, store in the database, okay? Pretty easy to understand. It, to it stores it effectively as a text string. Nothing wrong with that. It's compressed if it's long, if it's a long text string, um, but it's stored the same way we store XML, the same way we store text strings, okay? The only difference is that we have validation on that string, so you have to store valid JSON in there, and we have over a hundred JSON functions which allow you to manipulate and query different pieces of the JSON. Okay? Let's see what I mean. I went out to macaroo.com, which is sort of a random data generating website. Who knew they existed? 
Um, it fortunately dumps data out in JSON, so I effectively created a table called friend, and I copied uh, right here uh, my data over into, from the Makaru into my database, and I have a thousand records would be due. Here's an example of the first two records. My friend's name, it seems I have friends, uh, Eugene Reed and Amanda something. Um, and those are my friends, but I have, I have 998 more, so good for me. Uh, but you can see it's a standard JSON type of document. Um, I can convert that JSON to look more like what I would use in a JavaScript program, where typically when I'm doing JavaScript, I'll have braces and then I'll you know, kind of put up one on each line with commas, much easier to understand. I can pull individual fields out of the JSON. So I can say, go into the JSON document. If there is an email key, give me the value. So here's an example of five email addresses of my friends, okay? Um, I can concatenate things together. I'm saying here's first name and last name with a space between them. Let's uh, display those. Um, I can even use the, uh, this kind of uh, JSON interpolation inside of a where clause. So give me the first name where the last name equals Banks. Turns out I have two friends who have a last name of Banks. Um, I can even do it this way. This is that containment operator again, remember? Um, where I'm actually saying last name Banks and I'm using the containment operator and I'm converting the JSON data to JSONB. I'll talk about that in a minute. But again, I get the same, I get the same result. Um, if I find that I need to look up a particular field a lot, I can create an index, but in JSON, unlike JSONB, in JSON I can only index one key at a time. Okay, I can't index all of them unless I want to create an index for each one, each key that I could possibly have, which sounds horrendous. Solution coming in the next uh, couple slides. But what I'm doing is I'm saying, you know, I'm really always looking up by last name, so I'm just going to index the last name. So now when I run, when I, oops, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, now when I run this query uh, and I say last name of banks, because I've created an expression index, those of you who remember from here yesterday, I create an expression index, the last name, all of a sudden, yay, I get an index scan for my key that I'm interested in. That's, that's just great. Okay. Uh, I can also do calculations. I can say, Give me my friends who are in this IP address block. I can even do aggregates on these keys. So here's, give me my gender layout or my gender breakdown um, sums. How many male and female friends do I have? Uh, and it gives me kind of a layout there. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes. Are the keys case sensitive? And the answer is, I can't remember. Yes, no? It's, what is it in JSON? They're not case sensitive, right? JSON's not case sensitive. Are the keys case sensitive in, in JavaScript? Anybody? I think, uh, I think they are. Maybe they are. I have a feeling they are. So I think they are. That would be my guess. But whatever, whatever it is in JSON, it would be this. I can't remember how we implement it, but it follows the JSON spec. Yeah. Let's say they are. Um, if they are in, in two different rows, have the same, uh, let's say, last name, one in capital L, L and the second one in small L, um, would it know that you're trying to enter the wrong key? No, because effectively, JSON document doesn't have any knowledge of keys, so it would just. It would, it, would, it would think that's a completely different key. It would have no idea it was related to the other row. Yeah. Yes. Is there a way for write data to go into the database? Yes. Typically what you would do is when you create the table, you're going to add a check constraint. So when you create the table here, right here, you would say check, and in parentheses you would say data dash last name not null, for example, or exists this key exists in the field I'm about to enter. So you can actually put constraints around the JSON coming in using check constraints and we'll validate against those checks every time you do an insert or an update, right? And that's a lot of cases where people would use it because it's kind of annoying that um, 
there's no, there's no like schema on top of JSON that can be enforced, similar to what XML has a schema, but in this case, there's no schema. So the only way to enforce that schema is effectively to put it as check constraint. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. I'm sorry? This is a, uh, I, this is just a text index because it's really just a text value. Yeah, it's just a text index is the question, yeah. It's a B tree, it's a B tree index of text, yeah. Okay, all right, let's go to JSONB. JSONB is kind of JSON on steroids. There's a, not a whole lot of reasons to use JSON when you have JSONB, honestly. And I'll start to talk about some of the amazing stuff about this. So first off, um, one of the cool things about JSONB is the values are native JavaScript data types. That means that a value associated with a key can be a text string, but it can also be a number, it can also be a, a Boolean, it can also be a null, it can also be its own object, a sub-object, technically, okay? You can create an index of every key and every value in the column, not just the last name, but everyone, okay? Um, it's compressed, the keys are binary searchable, so it's very quick to parse and look up keys in, in, in JSONB. The only downside, it doesn't preserve key order, it doesn't preserve white space, and it doesn't retain last duplicate, okay? Uh, this is very similar to the H store, if you've ever used that, that we, have, we support. Here's an example of the downsides. You can see that the white space has gotten removed. This is the JSON up here. This is the JSON B example. Notice that the white space is removed here. Um, the duplicate name has been removed. So there is, it does kind of canonicalize your JSON a little bit, but again, there's a lot of positives. I would say you would use JSON if you just want to store the thing in and pull it back. If you're just wanting to input and output JSON, use the JSON data type. If there's any type of manipulation or indexing you want to use, you probably want to use JSONB because the ability to manipulate that without having to reparse the JSON string every time you access it is huge. Uh, here's an example, the same data, I'm going to load it into a JSONB table. I'm going to put a, uh, a gin index on it. There's two types of indexes for, G, for JSONB, but I'm just going to use the default one. Um, so here now I can look up uh, last name banks, okay, and I use this index, this index that I created right here. Notice when I created this index, I didn't specify a key at all. I just said data. I just said go and index everything. So what you can actually do is you can say, I can, I can look up last name, I can look up first name, same index. I can look up IP address, same index, okay? Um, so that's just really powerful in the way you can kind of do that, that the fact that it just indexes everything and you don't sort of have to decide what your queries are gonna need. Um, and this is the kind of thing that got people very excited about Postgres as a replacement for NoSQL type of stores. Yes? Uh, does this make your index really large? Yeah, the index is going to be kind of big. Um, although the key, uh, you might, I don't know if you were in the th thing yesterday, but as you remember, a gin index only stores the key once, right? So you're not storing the string last name over and over again. You're saying last name, and here's all the rows that have last name, right? And um, uh, those uh, pointers are also compressed. So actually, we've, the index has gotten pretty good. Um, I'll tell you, it's like a tenth the size of Mongo's, at least in version 2.4 of Mongo. So it, it, it's pretty good, but, but I guess it can get pretty big, yeah, because you are having to store a lot of pointers, particularly JSON documents are very large. Yeah, yes, sir? What about overheads for inserts and updates? Overheads for inserts and updates. Um, yeah, I mean, the GIN index has been optimized, so effectively, when you insert into a GIN index, it actually inserts into what we call a holding area. And the holding area effectively holds the changes, and we then flush them later to the actual index. And we look it up as we, we, we check the holding area anytime we look in the index and so forth. So, so the problem with GIN traditionally is if individual inserts and updates were very expensive. Uh, but because we have that holding area and we way we batch the changes into the index, the overhead is not as bad as you would, you would suspect, which is traditionally the problem with, with, uh, with bitmap indexes, too. They have that problem where it's just 
an insert can make it go berserk, you know, because uh, you got to expand the bitmap and all of those stuff. So because we're batching things, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. But that was identified very early as a problem. We, we, know, we always had a holding area, and it's gotten better over the years. And even in 9.5, we made some improvements to gin that made it much faster. Okay. All right. Two more to go. Row types. Um, this is a bizarre data type. It's actually a row you can store in a column. So here's an example. It, 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 the way you create a row data type is you say create type and the name of the, date of the row data type, and then you put the column values and the labels you want, the column names and the data types you want in the column, in the row type. So here I've got a driver's license row type, and now I can create a trucker table with a license of type driver's license. And effectively I can insert Jimbo Biggins as a truck driver, and I can specify his entire license information inside a single string. Now the problem, and I can do cool things, I can select star and it comes out fine, I can select just the, the, the row type, I can, even, I can even look inside of the row type and get a particular column from inside the row type. Okay? Keep in mind, this is going to be a problem if you need to like send it to a client because the client's going to be completely confused if you do this. Like it's going to be like, what is this? It's just like this string that's really hard to understand. So just don't go berserk with this one. You see this a lot used a lot in, in server side functions where people are having to kind of set up. Um, uh, they want to pass a row into a function and manipulate it. You see that a lot. Okay. So there's one more to go. Um, unfortunately, this is a pretty complicated one. So I'm going to have to kind of buzz through this. Um, but philosophically, a character string can be thought of as a multi-valued type because effectively, is it a collection of letters? Is it a collection of words? Is it a collection of lexumes? Like, it's kind of unclear. Is it a collection of prefixes? It, kind of a string is this amorphous thing. Like, a number is a number. But a string, it's kind of can be looked at a whole bunch of different ways. So in this case, I just took the fortune file from FreeBSD, loaded it in, got 59,000 rows uh, into a particular, a particular text field. Um, and you can do a whole bunch of cool things with string manipulation. And again, if you want to look at the slides later, um, I can do things like looking at underdog. Um, but in fact, there's no underdog, but there's an uppercase. So I can actually call a function on that. But that might not be cool for indexing. So I, if I create an index online, it can't use a lower of line. I talked about this yesterday, so I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, but you can actually create an expression index on lower. And then when I actually call underdog, even though it's all lowercase, it's going to find a match and use the index because I've created an expression index there. OK? Um, I can do prefix searches with like. Um, find, give me all the lines that begin with mop. Um, unfortunately, that gives me a sequential scan boo. Uh, however, I can create a special index called text pattern ops. And again, you can read this to understand why it's important. But if I create a text pattern ops index on that line, I can now find all of the lines that begin with MOP using that index. Okay? That still doesn't look at individual words. It's just looking at the beginning of the string. Okay? Um, I can combine those together. Uh, if, what if I want to find the lower of the prefix? I can create a text pattern ops with lower, and I get an index still. Okay? But that might not be enough. Maybe you want to search for words. You want to break the string up into words. Postgres supports full text index with a whole bunch of 15 languages. It supports stemming, which means remove things like ing and ed and plural from, from words and bring them down to their base, uh, um, you know, their base um, uh, word. Uh, you can remove stop words. You can put synonyms in there. We have prefix search coming in 9.6. So here's how you kind of set it up. You use a TS vector. Uh, TS vector effectively takes a word and breaks it up into its component parts. It gets rid of the stop words. It turns out that I and, and can are actually stop words here. Okay. You can use a TS query. And you can basically look and you can say, from this string, does the word hardly and wait exist? Yes. Does the word softly and weight exist? No. Okay. I can create an index on it with a TS vector, 
And now I can say, give me all of the lines that have the word pandas, and the word panda appears here. I can do um, this kind of query, and in fact, that panda search uses an index now. Remember I said, if it doesn't use an index, it's no good. Um, here's another one. Give me the, one, the, word, the lines that have the word cat and sleep. I got a line. Give me the words that have the word cat and sleep or nap. I get two lines. Cool. Um, I can also do prefix searches with this. Give me all of the lines that have the word, the words that begin with zip. And um, in fact, it uses an index, which is yay, yay, very good. But that might not be enough for you. Maybe you want to look at letters within a word. Letters within the word. Not the word, not the prefix, but the letters in the word. Here I have um, something called, um, here's an I like query where I'm actually doing that, but you know, it doesn't use an index, boo. But we do have something called PG trigram. It's in contrib. Uh, you can create a special gin index on PG trigram. And now when I go to look for the word verit, you find it uses an index. It uses this new trigram index that I've created. You can even use the trigram index to do prefixes if you're really crazy enough to do what I've just done here. And it returns the data and it uses an index. Cool. You can, you can also control similarity. You can say, give me all the lines that are similar to this, this string. That's a feature of, uh, of the, uh, the trigram uh, capability here. And we also have, there's a, it uses an index, like similarity. And we also have soundex, metaphone, and so forth if you want to use those. So these are all the indexes I created um, in, the, in the text in this last section. These are all indexes I created on text columns. And these are all of the data types that support the containment operator, that, that at sign greater that we saw over and over again. There's the one with circle. There's the one with JSONB. There's the one with TS query. There's the one with array. Okay, and that is it, folks. Um, we have run out of time, so I will be up here to answer any questions. I didn't get any questions sorted at the end. I realized I kind of had to run through it. I kind of knew that. Um, the, the dialogue about this is non-relational is great, but don't get carried away. You're gonna end up looking like this guy, right? Um, don't just stuff everything into one field. Uh, relational is cool. It just to be understand when you want to use it and when you probably don't. So thanks very much. I'll be up here to ask questions.